All right, so there we are in Acts chapter 2, and uh, the title for the sermon this afternoon is The Resurrection in the Old Testament. The Resurrection, sorry, in the New Testament. That was, that was uh, Wednesday. The Wednesday sermon was The Resurrection in the Old Testament. Uh, the sermon today is The Resurrection in the New Testament. Now, what I want you to notice, just a few verses there in verse number 29, it says here, Men and brethren, let me freely speak unto you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his sepulchre is with us unto this day. I want you to notice there that King David, a very important Old Testament saint, the king of Israel, his grave is still there with them today. He's still dead and buried, okay? But of course, when we talk about someone that is dead, a saint of God, they are, their spirit is with God, their soul is with God. They are in heaven, are they not? They definitely are in heaven. But I want you to notice the emphasis here is on resurrection, a bodily resurrection, a resurrection of the flesh. And what's being pointed out here is David has not yet experienced that resurrection. And verse number 30, Therefore being a prophet, that's David being a prophet, and knowing that God hath sworn an oath to him, that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. So when, did, when was Christ risen up to sit on the throne? After the resurrection, right? And it's pointed out here that the one that would sit on the throne of God would be the fruit of the loins of David, would be according to the flesh, okay? So important to understand the resurrection that's mentioned here. Verse number 31, he's seen this before, spake of the resurrection of Christ, okay? Now, when we talk about the resurrection in the New Testament, we talk about our resurrection, we talk about our rapture, the first thing we must do is think about the resurrection of Christ. Because if not for the resurrection of Christ, a physical, fleshly, bodily resurrection, we would not be able to experience that same thing. It's only through Christ that we can experience this resurrection. But it says here that his soul was not left in hell, neither his flesh did see corruption. So the resurrection of Christ is his soul departing from hell, being reunited with that flesh. That flesh did not see corruption, why? Because remember we read in 1 Corinthians 15 that that which is corruptible must put on incorruption, okay? So Christ receives this new, resurrected, glorified body. And then it says here in verse number 32, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this, which you now see and hear. Now look at verse number 34. For David is not ascended into the heavens. Well, where is David then? Well, what are we talking about? We start off in verse 29, his sepulchre, his grave, right? When the Bible says here in verse 34 that David has not ascended into heavens, they're talking about the, the physical resurrection, that David has not ascended into heaven in the flesh, Okay? Now again, his soul, his spirit, yes, is in heaven. Yes, it's there. Just like um, uh, the, uh, the prophet, uh, the apostle John. Remember when he was caught up into the spirit in heaven, but he was bodily alive on the earth, but his spirit was ascended or caught up into heaven. Okay? But bodily he was not. Okay? We have something similar, except with David and all the Old Testament saints, they are physically dead, but their soul and their spirits are in heaven. But right now, David is not ascended into the heavens. This is important because there are those that will twist, again, the resurrection of the Old Testament saints. But let's keep going. For David is not ascended into the heavens, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make, make thy fall, the foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye crucified, both Lord and Christ. Okay? So the key thing I want you to take out of there is the resurrection of Christ is a bodily, fleshly resurrection in comparison to the Old Testament saints that have not yet had that bodily, fleshly resurrection just yet, okay? When the Jehovah Witnesses speak of the resurrection of Christ, I mean, they've got a lot of problems in their teachings, but that primarily, they reject the fleshly, bodily resurrection of Christ. They just believe He he ascended in the spirit or whatever, right? And, and his spirit is in heaven. Whereas, no, Christ had a fleshly, bodily resurrection. And the comparison there is with David. His grave, his body, his bones are still there in the grave, okay? Now, 
When we talk about the resurrection, we must differentiate between two types of resurrection, okay? I'm not talking about the resurrection of the, of the living and the resurrection of the damned. I'm talking about the Bible speaks a lot about resurrection. There's a lot of people that die and, go, and, and are brought back to life, okay? Be- even before Christ, okay? Now, this resurrection, though, is different, okay? Go to Matthew 27, please. Matthew 27, verse 50. Matthew 27, verse 50. Because the Rachmanites, the hyper-dispensationalists will say, well, some say that no, the Old Testament saints already had their resurrection. And they'll point to Matthew 27, verse 50. Go to Matthew 27, verse 50. Again, about the resurrection of Christ, Matthew 27, 50, it says, Jesus, when he had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain, from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. Now, if you stop reading there, it sounds like these graves were opened when Jesus died, when he yielded up the ghost. But actually, verse 53 uh, clarifies this. It says here, And came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Okay, so... The resurrection of Christ was so powerful, okay? It just opened up the graves and these Old Testament saints just came back to life. And it kind of sounds like that story where that dead person was buried in a rush and it touched Elisha's bones and he came back to life, right? I mean, but with Christ, his resurrection, you know, just somehow awakens these graves. And these, some, it says there are many bodies, not all of the Old Testament saints, just many of the saints came back to life, Okay? Now, one saint that definitely did not come back to life here was David, because David's grave was still there. But here's the thing about this resurrection. This resurrection is not a resurrection of a new, glorified, uh, incorruptible body. It is a resurrection of the same corruptible body that we still have, okay? Meaning that people that died and was brought back to life, um, when they, if they were brought back to life, they could still sin. You know, they, 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 in other words, they would still die, okay? So these saints that have died in the past... Now, I don't fully understand. The Bible doesn't give us much more information than this, what they were doing. I guess it was a shock. <laughs> I guess they're preaching the gospel. I, I don't know. Maybe they're given a second chance to preach the gospel. But they would have died again, is what I'm saying. They would have died again because they did not receive their new resurrected bodies just yet. I'll prove that to you later. But there are many people. Like I said, you know, Elisha, or the, the dead man that uh, touched Elisha's dead bones was brought back to life. Elijah raised a widow's son in the Old Testament. Elisha also raised a, a woman's son. We know the story where Jesus, you know, had compassion on a widow and he raised her dead son for, to life as well. Remember, remember the story of Jairus' daughter? She was raised from the dead. Of course, the most famous one is Lazarus. He was raised from the dead. And then even after Christ went to heaven and the, new, the apostles were doing works of God, even we have Peter who raised Tabitha from the dead, if you remember that. And remember the story where Paul raised a man who fell asleep during church. Three stories up, he fell out the window or whatever, <laughs> fell off the back balcony, and he died, and Paul brought him back to life. Okay? But all of these resurrections are not the resurrection of the new glorified body. Okay? That's not... That, that, these are other resurrections. Just come back in your... Like, like you were before. You've come back to life for, for God's purposes. So we must differentiate between those two things. Okay? It's not the same type of resurrection. Now, please go to Acts 24. Acts 24, verse 14. Acts 24, verse 14. These are the words of Paul after he was arrested, you know, for causing unrest, for preaching about Christ, for preaching the gospel. Acts 24, verse 14. What I just want to keep further driving home here is that the resurrection of the Old Testament saints is the same resurrection of the New Testament saints. The Old Testament saints have not been resurrected from the dead yet in the manner of Christ, with that new resurrected body. It hasn't happened yet. Look at Acts 24, 14. Acts 24, 14. This is after Christ is sent into heaven, after Paul is preaching to, you know, uh, know, the New Testament churches have started, Paul is is preaching, and he says this, But this I confess unto thee, that after the way which they call heresy, so worship I the God of my fathers. Look at this. Believe in all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. 
Paul is saying, look, I'm just believing the Old Testament scriptures. I'm just believing what the Old Testament prophets of old said. That's all I'm, you know, that's what I'm getting in trouble for, for believing what they wrote about. Now, notice the column at the end of prophets, so it expands on what that is. And have hope toward God, which they themselves allow, that there shall be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and unjust. Okay? So he says, look, the Old Testament saints taught on this. They wrote about this. And all I'm doing is believing what they wrote, that there's a resurrection to come. And this resurrection is of the just and of the unjust. We've seen that on Wednesday. There's a resurrection to life, and there's a resurrection of damnation. Okay? This resurrection is a resurrection that follows the resurrection of Christ that is in the same manner. The one of the just follows after the example of Christ, and the one of the unjust are for the ones that have rejected Christ. And we saw that on Wednesday, that the ones that did not have their names found in the book of life were cast into everlasting fire. Now, please go to, uh, I'll get you to go to um, 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 is the chapter on the resurrection. I mean, if you just want verse after verse, and you want just black and white doctrine on, 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 the, on the resurrection, on the rapture, that is the chapter, okay? Just jot it down, 1 Corinthians 15, another one of my favorite chapters in the Bible. Definitely, like, top three for me, personally. 1 Corinthians 15, Okay? But while you're turning to 1 Corinthians 15, let me just ask you, you know, ask the question, why is teaching on the resurrection important? Why do we need to know this? Say, so maybe it's not worth it, you know, because, you know, you're fighting with your independent Baptists on the pre-trib rapture, post-trib rapture. Maybe we shouldn't just, maybe we should just not teach it. Let's just get along with the things that we all agree on and just don't teach on the things we disagree on because it ruffles people's feathers. It doesn't ruffle my feathers if someone believes the preacher of rapture. It doesn't bother me if someone believes it, okay? What bothers me is when that brother wants to break fellowship with someone like me <laughs> for not believing that or for getting upset, you know, that I have a different belief to that. I, I don't get upset when people believe differently <laughs> because I'm sure in what I believe. You know, I have doctrine, I have scripture on why I believe what I believe. I have the confidence of the word of God. You only get offended when you haven't got the confidence, right? And, and someone's challenging you and you don't have the confidence from the Word of God, okay? But why is it important to teach on the resurrection? Romans 6, 4 says, Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. And that's where we get the name of our church, New Life Baptist Church. But verse number five says this, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also, look at this, in the likeness of his resurrection. We are going to have a resurrection, and it's going to be like his resurrection. We've had a spiritual death, like the death that Christ had. You know, our sins have been nailed to the cross, as it were. Christ died in our place. Okay, he died for us. But he also resurrected for us, okay? And so our resurrection will be in the likeness of that. The reason why the teaching of the resurrection is so important is like it said in verse number four, I'll just read the second part again, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk, that's today, we should walk in newness of life. So in light of the truth of the resurrection, in light of the truth that we will have these new glorified bodies that never sin. Because we know that truth, because Christ opened those doors, we should today, even though we haven't got those bodies today, we should still strive to walk in units of life. We should still strive to walk as though we have those new resurrected bodies. Now, we don't have that flesh, right? That new flesh, but we do have the new spirit. And by walking in the spirit, that gives us the ability to subdue this flesh and make it seem as though we have those future bodies to come. Okay, this is why important. It's important because we are to live in light of that truth. It's not like God says, "Okay, wait till you get those bodies so you can live righteously." No, God wants us to live righteously today with that promise to come of those new bodies. Okay, so that's why it's important. Okay, number one, so we can live in accordance with that. The second reason it's important to teach on the resurrection, I'll just read it to you. Hebrews six one, it gives us some foundational doctrines. It says, "Therefore, leaving the principles." Of the doctrine of Christ, 
let us go on to perfection, or let us mature, let, let us continue learning is what it's saying there, right? Not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. These are all fundamental truths, right? That we need to repent from trusting our dead works. We need to uh, put our faith on God. Of the doctrine of baptisms, this is another fundamental basic thing. And of laying on of hands. And then it says this, and of resurrection of the dead. And of eternal judgment. The Bible here says that the resurrection of the dead is a foundational doctrine. It's a fundamental doctrine. It's important. You know, and the fact that the JWs do not believe in that bodily resurrection immediately just says that is a not, that's not a true church of God. Immediately. Just, just by denying that fundamental truth, they are not a true church of God. They are a cult, the JWs, okay? So this is why it's important because there are some doctrines that are so important that if you miss it, if you forget it, if you, if you in, make it insignificant, it will mess up your doctrines on, in other places, okay? Now, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. The other reason why teaching on the resurrection is important is because by, by denying the resurrection of the saints, by extension, we are denying the resurrection of Christ. By extension. Even though you may not realize that, okay? But that's what it means if you deny the resurrection of the saints. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 12. Remember, he's writing to the Corinthian church, okay? There are some in the Corinthian, and we know the church was really messed up. Lots of babes in Christ. They're just not doing very well in the teaching department. But verse number 12. Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead. Now, stop there. Was the Corinthian church teaching that Christ rose from the dead? Yeah. Okay, that's what we gather there, right? Now, if Christ be preached that he rose from the dead, how say some among you that there is no resurrection of the dead? So it's not that they're denying that Christ rose from the dead. It's just that some in the church were saying, well, there's no resurrection for us. You know, they, they just had the thought that we just go to heaven in the spirit and that's the end of it. You know, there is no this physical resurrection. All right? Look at verse number 13. But if there be no resurrection of the dead, that's of us, then is Christ not risen? <laughs> and if Christ be not risen, then, our, then is our preaching vain and your faith is also vain. All right, so... These two things go together. The rapture, our resurrection, is tied in to the resurrection of Christ. Without the resurrection of our bodies, then Christ did not raise from the dead. That's what it's saying. Okay. So if you believe in the resurrection of Christ, you must believe in the resurrection of the saints. Okay, or the resurrection of the dead. All right. Now drop down to verse number 20. Verse number 20. It says here, But now is Christ risen from the dead. And become the first fruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, that's Adam, okay, Adam, uh, death came through Adam, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. And that man is Jesus, okay, Jesus. So Adam is like a type of Christ. You know, we're all going to die because of Adam's sin, but we're all going to live if we're in Christ because of Christ's sacrifice and resurrection, okay? Drop down to verse number 22. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. Um, I might just skip this because I'm going to cover this later on. Yeah, I'll, I'll just skip that. But I just want to show you that our resurrection is tied in to the resurrection of Christ. Now drop down to verse number 50, please. Same chapter. 1 Corinthians 15, 50. Why is the resurrection necessary? Why? Okay. It says here, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither doth corruption inherit incorruption. Look, the grave of King David, even though he was a man after God's own heart, he cannot go to heaven in that body that's in the grave. All right? He's made of that flesh and blood. His grave remains there. His bones remain there till this day, even today, wherever that grave is, right? The bones of David are still there. And he cannot completely inherit the kingdom of God just yet. Yes, he's in heaven, but he cannot physically inherit the kingdom of God just yet. All right? And then uh, verse, if you can, now let, let's go to verse number 42. Let's track back, backtrack a little bit. 1 Corinthians 15, 42. It says here, so also is the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption. 
It is raised in incorruption. I love these words, right? That we have corruptible bodies. You're corrupt. Do you wonder why you sin? You're corrupt. There's nothing good in you, all right? Nothing good in you. But it, it is sown in corruption, and it is raised in incorruption. I love that, right? Look at this, verse number 43. It is sown in dishonor. You know, without Christ, you're just dishonorable. There's no honor in you in the eyes of God. But then it is, it is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. You're weak today, okay? You're physically weak. You're going to get sick. You can't live forever. But then it says, it is raised in power. The new bodies are going to be powerful bodies. I, I can't fully understand what we're going to be able to do, okay? But we're going to be like Christ. It is sown a natural body. It is raised a spiritual body. There is a natural body and there is a spiritual body, okay? This is why it's important. We need that spiritual body. We need those honorable, powerful, incorruptible bodies to come. That's the only way we can be in heaven. The new heavens, the new earth, the only way we can possibly see God is by having those new resurrected bodies seen with, the, with our eyes, right? Verse number 45. For so it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. The last Adam is a reference to Christ. Howbeit that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. So in order for you to be saved, you first have to be born in the natural, then you're given that spiritual birth, and then you're given that spiritual body. Okay? Verse number 47. The first man is of the earth, earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly. Brethren, you're earthly right now. In the bodies you walk around with, they are earthly because they're from the earthly. As, and as is the heavenly, they are, sorry, such are they also that are heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthly, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Okay, so you're like Adam because you were born through Adam. But one day we're going to be given these heavenly, spiritual, new resurrected, glorious bodies. And we're going to be more like Christ than ever before. Okay, uh, what, what, a, what a great promise. And then it says, uh, no, I just read it there to you. So there needs to be a change in our bodies. Now, I might get Sebastian and Matthias. I need another, another couple of volunteers. Can you guys come up here? Sebastian and Matthias. I've taught him this many times, but let's just do this very quickly. The Bible teaches, I'll represent the body. Um, Matthias can represent the spirit, and Sebastian can represent the soul. And we know that human beings, we're, we're given a body, soul, and spirit, okay? And when you're born into this world, you know, you're born in that hev earth, you can't see Sebastian? <laughs> we're, we're born in these earthly bodies, right? And when we're born, we have the body, the soul, and the spirit. But the Bible teaches us in Romans chapter 7, there comes a time when we come to realize and understand that we're sinners, we've broken God's laws, and the Bible says that the law slays us. The knowledge of sin basically kills us, but we're not dead in the physical body, but the spirit dies. Now, actually, we'll put it this way. We'll say on this side is death, okay? This side represents death. And this side represents life, okay? So most people walk this earth in that earthly body. Their soul is still there, is using that vehicle of the physical body, but they're spiritually dead, okay? And we need to win souls, okay? And when we go and preach the gospel, we speak of that being born again, being born of the Spirit, right? But here's the thing. If someone does not believe on Christ, is not born again, and their body dies, you know, their body goes over here. Now, in, in, in the realm of death, we have the body and we have the spirit. So where do you think the soul is going to go? It's going to join, it's going to come here. And the soul will be punished in hellfire. This is the sad reality. This is the bad news, okay? But the good news is, while people are still living, okay, they hear the gospel, they should hear the gospel, be saved, and the Bible says that they are spiritually born again, born of the Spirit. And that's when the dead spirit is revived, becomes that new creature in Christ, born again, 
child of God, okay? But I'm still walking this earth in this corrupted body. I'm still working on, walking on this earth in this earthly body, and there's the spirit, okay? And this earthly body still wants to do earthly things, wants to do sinful things, wants to please itself. And this spirit, born of God, perfect, without sin, is saying, stop doing those things. And there's that constant battle, right, between the spirit and the flesh. And we ought to try to walk in accordance to that new man over here, okay? But here's, here's the news. So if I were to die tomorrow, before the rapture, then my body were to, is to die, dies, right? And my body would go over here in death, in the grave, okay, in the sepulcher. But my spirit is alive. The spirit goes to be with God. And so does that soul, okay? The soul is there with God, you know? When, when the thief died on the cross, his body was hanging on that cross, was in death. But Jesus says that he will be, t- today that shall be with me in paradise, said Jesus Christ. So they, there they are in heaven with God. But in the grave, here's my body. I've not yet ascended to heaven, in my physical body. I'm like King David was, okay? But here's the promise. When God comes back, okay, when Christ comes in the clouds, it says that he's coming with his saints, right? So when Christ descends from the clouds, he takes my new man with him in the clouds, brings it all the way back to the grave, and in the grave, he gives me those new resurrected bodies. Now, for the first time, spirit was already saved, the new man, the body has that heavenly body now, the resurrected body, and I'm all one now. You know, I'm in heaven, I'm with Christ, body, soul, and spirit in heaven forever with Christ. Okay, that's the reality of the resurrection, okay? But for our, our loved ones that have died in Christ, right now their position is over here. Bodies in the grave, in the realm of death, as it were, the bodies, but soul and spirit with God. One day they're going to come reclaim that body, be resurrected, and we're all going to be here happy together in the clouds with Jesus Christ. Sit down. Thanks, guys. Okay, so that's the reality of our Christian life. And uh, if you guys can please go to verse number 54. Verse number, oh, sorry, 51. Go to verse number 51. Verse number 51. And this is the promise of the rapture, the resurrection. Now, I, I use these terms interchangeably, the resurrection and the rapture, okay? But we know there's a resurrection of the damned. Okay, so when I say resurrection, it can mean multiple things, okay? But when we say rapture, we just mean something specific. The rapture is a resurrection when Christ comes in the clouds. But there is another resurrection to come afterwards. I'll show you later on. But it says here in verse number 51, Behold, I show you a mystery. And if you go to Bible college, I'll tell you, well, mystery means that it's never been revealed before. Okay, if there's a mystery, nobody knows about it. And now it's going to be revealed. That's if you go to Bible college. And then they'll say, well, this mystery has been revealed to the Corinthian church and New Testament. Therefore, Jesus could have never t- taught on this mystery. Okay? And so this is the first time. See, Jesus never taught on the rapture, they'll say. But we know already, we looked at that on Wednesday. That's, that's totally ridiculous. But that's what they say. They think the mystery is the resurrection. But no, that is not the mystery. We've just talked about what that mystery is. Okay? It's not the resurrection. It's what the resurrection means. That's the mystery, okay? Behold, I show you a mystery. Look at this. Look at the mystery. We shall not all sleep, but, here it is. This is the mystery. But we shall all be changed. That's the mystery. Our physical bodies will have a change. It's not just a resurrection of the same dead old body. It is a body that will be changed. And what do we see? From earthly to heavenly, okay? From, from physical to a spiritual, new resurrected body in the power of Christ, okay? That's the mystery, that it's not just another normal resurrection, but one that reflects the body of Christ, okay? Look at this, verse number 52. We, uh, we shall all be changed in a moment. The change happens instantly, right? In the twinkling of an eye, the change. Not the entire rapture, not the entire process of Christ coming in the clouds, resurrected from the, you know, from the earth. No, no. The change in our bodies happens in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump. So there's going to be a trumpet. Boom, ba-da, boom, And then our bodies will just change like that. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Notice that he says it over again. Changed, incorruptible, right? From, from uh, dishonorable to powerful, 
You know, uh, to from, from corruptible to incorruptible, from mortal to immortal. That's the mystery, that our bodies will be a new, resurrected, glorified body, just like Christ was when he rose again from the dead. That's the mystery. And so it's a false teaching to say this is the first time the resurrection is taught or the rapture is taught. No, it, the mystery is the new bodies, okay, the, the brand new bodies that reflect Christ's body. The other way to, to, um, to, to explain this is, I'm not sure, you know, obviously our Bibles, the, the books of the Bible are not in chronological order. You know, they're not, they're not necessarily in that order. They're, 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 um, they're put together in an order for reading purposes, usually by um, category of, or types of books, okay? And I've not done this research myself, but it seems to be universal that Paul wrote the Thessalonian epistles, First and Second Thessalonians, before he wrote the Corinthians epistles, okay? That the first epistles... Paul ever wrote was on, was on Thessalonians. And if you know, 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians are the main epistles on the resurrection of Christ. The main epistles on the rapture. So if he's already revealed that about the rapture, and then he's writing 1 Corinthians, obviously it wasn't a mystery then. I mean, even if we say, okay, even if we buy into the, 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 the idea that Jesus never taught it, well, Paul taught it already, chronologically, before he started to write 1 Corinthians 15, Okay but he revealed the mystery of our bodies being like unto Christ. That was the mystery. Okay. Now, please, um, please go to verse number 54. Verse number 54. I'll just read another passage to you in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1, just as a reminder of what this means. It says here, 1 John 3, 1, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us. You know, John's saying, look, just, just stop and think for a moment how much God loves you, how much he's bestowed upon us. Look, that we should be called the sons of God. That's the first thing, right? Just, you should stop and meditate for a moment. I am a son of God. And that should give you pause and say, man, how much does God love me? All right? And then it says, therefore, the world knoweth us not because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. There's confirmation. We will be like Christ when he appears. And just, and so, and so, look, we should just, it should just blow our minds, number one, just to think that we're the sons of God. But, and we don't even understand what it means to have these new resurrected bodies. You know, how much love, how much God has in store for us. We don't fully get it. You know, I can, I can teach on it. We can believe the truths. But until we experience it, we're just not really going to fully comprehend it. You know, how wonderful God's love is toward us. And you guys are in verse number 54. And I want you to notice these words here. So when, and I've heard, again, I taught this on Wednesday, but it says, So when this corruptible shall have put on incorruption, and this mortal should have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Now, I taught on this on Wednesday. I don't want to reha rehash it all. But that statement comes from Isaiah 25, 8. And let me just read it again. But I just want to emphasize another part of this. Isaiah 25, 8. It says, he will swallow up death in victory. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from off all faces. And the rebuke of his people shall he take away from off the earth, for the Lord hath spoken it. I want you to notice that. So the rapture, the resurrection to come, putting on these new, immortal, perfect, glorious, glorious bodies is associated with the Lord wiping away tears from off all faces. That's confirmed for us there in Isaiah, speaking of the same truth that we just read in 1 Corinthians 15. Now, just keep that in mind. I'm going to get back to that very soon, but just keep in mind those two things are associated together. Now go to verse number 23, 1 Corinthians 15, 23. I know we're jumping around, but there are so many truths that we need to understand here. 1 Corinthians 15, 23. Because there's an order, there's a chronology to the resurrection. It's not disorderly. There's a process behind this. 1 Corinthians 15, 23. But every man in his own order, including Christ. It says here, Christ the first fruits, okay? So who is the first to be truly resurrected from the dead with that new glorified body? 
It's only Christ. Anyone else that, was, that's, that experienced a resurrection was a resurrection of the same corrupted bodies, okay? But Christ, no. Even Christ's body was one that could die. Obviously, he died on the cross, okay? But he was given a new resurrected body at the resurrection. Christ, the firstfruits. Afterward, they that are Christ's at his coming. Hey, what's the rapture? The coming of Christ, okay? We've seen that before, all right? So at the rapture, that's the next group that received this order of resurrection. And then verse 24, Then cometh the end, when he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God. Let's stop there for a moment. Christ will rule and reign for a thousand years. That's his kingdom, okay? And all things are going to be subdued under Christ during that time. At the end of that thousand years, it says here, he'll deliver the kingdom up to God. Now, when it says Christ is giving it to, the, to God, that's obviously God the Father, yeah, okay? Oh, it says that, even the Father, right? It's confirmed for us. Kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power. For he must reign till he have put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. Now, we need to put this together. Because we know those corruptible bodies uh, can be, in, obviously can die. Has the, you know, the power of death can rest over those physical bodies. But at the end of the millennium, the last enemy that will be subdued under Christ or destroyed is death. Okay? And when we're raptured, our new resurrected bodies, we will never experience death again. You know, we've already destroyed death as it were. We will never ex experience that ever once we have that new resurrected body. Okay? But there is a coming a time when death would be totally destroyed. And that happens at the end of the millennium as he's given it to the Father. Now, this is important because please go to Revelation 7. Revelation 7 verse 14. Revelation 7 verse 14. I'm focusing on the resurrection of the just. I'm focusing on the resurrection of the saints right now, okay? That follows after the pattern of Christ. Christ the firstfruits. Revelation 7 14. And this is about that great multitude that appears in heaven. In verse 14, it says, And I said unto him, Sir, thou knowest. So the, the question gets asked, Who are they? He goes, Well, you know. And he said unto me, These are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed their robes and have made them white in the blood of the Lamb. Who are these people? What are they experiencing? Look at verse number 17. Verse 17. For the Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them and shall lead them unto living fountains of water. Look at this. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. Is that a resurrection? Was wiping the tears away from the eyes associated with the resurrection? Yes. Okay. So when we're reading 1 Corinthians 15, and it goes back to Isaiah about, Oh, death, where is thy sting? Um... Oh, grave, where is thy victory? Or did I get those the other way around? Anyway, it's pointing to the fact that at the resurrection that's mentioned in 1 Corinthians 15, it ties it into Revelation 7, those that came out of great tribulation and their tears are wiped from off their face. You see that? So when does this take place? When is the coming of Christ? When is the rapture? After the tribulation. Post-tribulation. That's what we're reading. If we put it all together, Christ wipes away all their tears. Okay, all our that'll be us. All right, whatever tears, whatever we, last chance to vent all our problems to God, all the sufferings we had, and He'll take care of it all. Okay? He'll comfort us. He'll wipe away our tears. Last time we will ever cry. Okay. Now we spoke about Christ because Christ comes, then He pours out His wrath, then He rules and reigns for a thousand years. And what happens at the end of the thousand years again? Before giving up the kingdom to the Father, death is destroyed. Death is the final enemy. Okay, this is important because there are people that live on the earth, obviously, you know, that are in their natural corrupted bodies that go into that millennium. They have kids and etc. And the population increases from there during that thousand year time. So they can still die. They just die at a very old age. Okay, they're still in those corrupted bodies. And this is why it's important to identify the fact that death actually is destroyed, not at the rapture. For us, it will be because we'll never experience death. But ultimately, death will be destroyed at the end of that thousand years. So let's go to that end of that thousand years. Go to Revelation 20 now. Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. Let's go to the end of the thousand years. 
Revelation chapter 20, verse 7. The Bible reads, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. So are we at the end of the thousand years? Yes. At the end of the millennial reign of Christ. Okay? Drop down to verse number 14. It tells us that after, after the thousand years, just confirming these two truths, it says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Is death destroyed at the end of the thousand years? Yes. The power of death, whatever that looks like in the spiritual realm, I don't fully understand it. But death is taken and itself is cast into the lake of fire. It is destroyed there in the lake of fire. Okay? This is at the end of the thousand years. So we do see 1 Corinthians 15 is perfectly aligned with Revelation chapter 20. Now, look at verse number 1. Revelation 21 Sorry, yeah, Revelation 21, verse 1. Revelation 21, verse 1. Again, I'm just focusing on our resurrection, okay? And again, there are people that will live during that millennium, okay? And then, after the end of the millennium, God creates what? A new heaven and a new earth. But remember, we read that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So these people that live during the millennium that are saved, not the ones that join the devil and rebel against Christ, that's for another time, but the ones that are truly saved, that have their faith on Christ, don't they, wouldn't they then need a new resurrected body as well? Absolutely. In order for them to experience new heavens and new earth. So what happens at the end of the millennium? Revelation 21 verse 1. Revelation 21 verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard, a great vo- I heard a great voice of heaven saying, so there's a voice coming out of heaven. What are they saying? Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. So this voice is coming out of heaven. Now look what God does to this voice coming out of heaven. Verse number four. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. So even though it's not spelt out for us, okay, we definitely know some truths. To go to heaven, you need those new resurrected bodies. To seek God, to be in that kingdom, you need those new resurrected bodies. God creates new heaven and new earth. Therefore, those that are born after the rapture, that believe on Christ, they must have a resurrection. They must. And what do we find at the end of the millennium? God's wiping the tears once again. Okay? What is that wiping of tears associated with? A resurrection. So what I'm saying to you is this, is brethren, is this. Christ rose from the dead first. Then the order is, at his coming, at the rapture, we will be resurrected. Our tears will be wiped. Those that get saved after the rapture, At the end of their millennium, they're going to get their resurrected body. God will wipe away their tears from off their eyes. Okay? So we see the consistency there of the Bible. And death is totally destroyed, right? There'll be no more death. It's gone. It's finished. It's totally finished. Okay? There's no one else on the earth that will ever experience a death like that. Okay? God creates a new heaven and the new earth. Now, please go back to Revelation 20, verse number 4. So obviously, the New Testament writings is consistent with the Old Testament writings on the rapture, on the resurrection, consistent, but it gives us so much more. You know, it helps with the timing, the chronology, the change of the bodies, gives us so much more detail, right? But it's still consistent, okay? It's the same resurrections that the Old Testament saints would experience the same as ours. Revelation 20, verse 4, speaking about the tribulation period, and it says, and I saw thrones... Uh, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, and which had not worshipped the beast. So that's during the tribulation time, right? These people that are sitting on thrones are people that did not worship the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Okay, so they've lived with Christ a thousand 
They're, they're, they're on the earth, reigning with Christ for a thousand years. And notice what it says in verse number five. But the rest of the dead, so of course those that lived after the rapture, the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. So there's another confirmation for you that at the end of the thousand years that the dead will live again. That, that resurrection where Christ then has to wipe away the tears again. But when, it talks about, when, when the Bible talks about the resurrection of the dead, it's not always about the saved. It could be about the damned or it could, be a, it could be just be a general resurrection altogether. Okay? You'll notice that if you do like a word study for resurrection of the dead, not till the thousand years were finished, this is the first resurrection. Okay? The first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On such the second death have no power, and they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him a thousand years. So the ones that experience the first resurrection, right? Christ comes the first fruits, then at his coming, those people, that's us, are going to rule and reign with Christ for a thousand years. And if you lose your life, if it happens that you lose your life for Christ in the tribulation, you get extra special privilege of thrones, extra privilege of, of positions of authority, okay? But we're going to rule with Christ for a thousand years. And again, the rest of the dead are not risen till the end of that thousand years, okay? The end of that thousand years, there's another resurrection. We already saw this on Wednesday. Those that have rejected Christ, they are resurrected in the dead bodies and they're cast into the lake of fire because their names are not found written in the book of life. And then we have the ones that did believe on Christ, they go into the new heaven and the earth, they have their tears wiped from off their faces, okay? Now, just very quickly, I don't, I don't want to split hairs too much. The Bible refers to this resurrection of the believers as the first resurrection. Some people say, well, that means there must be a second resurrection. And they'll say, well, that second resurrection must therefore be the end of the millennium. That's not how I read it, but there's nothing wrong if that's how you read it. It doesn't really mess up. It doesn't change any, any doctrine, okay? I read the first resurrection not as that there's a second resurrection, but rather the first resurrection is a type of resurrection. In other words, I would say, and I could be, I'm, I'm happy to be proven wrong, but the Bible's a bit vague in this, on this issue here. But I would say that when you're raptured, that is the first resurrection, and those that believed on Christ and are, rapt, are resurrected at the end of the millennium, that they also experience in the first resurrection that we are, we are experiencing the same resurrection just at different points of time, but so the first is a type uh, uh, in association with Christ the first fruits. It's the same type of resurrection that Christ the first fruits experienced. That's how I understand it. But if you think, well, the rapture is not the first, and at the end of the millennium, that's the second, I'm fine with you. It doesn't make a big deal. It's the fact that we both believe those resurrections that happened at the same time, oh, at, at those times, and they're saved people. The amillennialists have a different view on what first and second resurrection is. They also read the first resurrection here, okay? But they don't believe in a literal millennium. They believe the millennium is now, okay? Now, we saw that those that will live during the millennium, will rule with Christ in the millennium, that they have already experienced the first resurrection. We saw that already. So because they believe it's the millennium now, they believe when you get saved, you've experienced the first resurrection. They believe being born again is the first resurrection, and they believe when you get your new glorified bodies, that's the second resurrection at the end of the figurative millennium. Okay. I, I was not, you know, I'm not trying to confuse you. I'm just showing you how different people interpret things a little bit differently. Okay? But that, that would be, that's a total heresy though. <laughs> okay? that, that's wrong. That's, that's completely wrong. But anyway, I don't want to get too sidetracked. Now, I want you to notice um, verse number... Oh, yeah. So where did I stop reading from? Oh, verse number five. Let's read verse number six. Revelation 20, verse six. Blessed and holy is he that have part in the first resurrection. I already read that. On such the second death have no power. So I, I would say that those that are raised at the end of the millennium to Christ with resurrected bodies, they also experience, they don't experience the second death. That's why I believe they also experience in the first resurrection as a type. Okay. But here's the thing that I need you to understand. When it comes to the first resurrection, that is one name given to the resurrection of the just, resurrection of the believers. The Bible uses these different names at different times, but it's all the same resurrection, okay? So we saw there the resurrection of, um, or the first resurrection as it's called. 
Luke 14, 14 calls it the resurrection of the just. Acts 24, 15 also calls it the resurrection of the just. Daniel 12, 2 calls it the resurrection to eternal life. Okay. John 5, 29, Jesus calls it the resurrection to life. Luke 20, 36 calls us that experience this resurrection, the children of the resurrection. And Hebrews 11.35 calls it the better resurrection. The better resurrection, okay? Um, better in the sense that you're not being resurrected with your same corruptible bodies, but the, 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 the changed bodies to be like Christ is a better resurrection, okay? In contrast, at the end of those thousand years, those that rejected Christ, yes, they will be resurrected in dead bodies, cast into the lake of fire, the Bible in Daniel 12, 2 calls it the resurrection to shame and everlasting contempt. Okay? John 5, 29 calls it the resurrection, resurrection of damnation. And Acts 24, 15 calls it the resurrection of the unjust. Okay? So there is a resurrection for those that re- reject Christ, but it's not one unto life. It's one unto death, one unto damnation, one unto contempt, that being in the lake of fire. Okay? And again, when you're reading your Bible, it talks about the resurrection of the dead or from the dead. This is more of a general umbrella term, just in reference to the generation, uh, the resurrection as a whole, but also the context will dictate whether it's a resurrection of the just or the unjust as well. So you just got to look at the, the context there. All right. So that's the resurrection in the New Testament, brethren. I haven't gone through the time. I have touched on the timing, right, after the tribulation, but we'll get into that uh, as we continue on in the series. The key thing I wanted to focus on there, brethren, the Old Testament resurrection, the New Testament resurrection, is the same resurrection. Okay? And we can only experience that resurrection if we've believed on Christ and because Christ rose again from the dead. And I think it's an amazing privilege, an amazing thought to think, not only that we're saved, but we're going to be given these bodies, these new glorified, resurrected, sinless, immortal, uncorruptible, powerful bodies. What an amazing thought. I can't, you know, it'll be even better than the bodies that, Abraham, uh, that Adam and Eve had before they sinned. Okay, even better than that. Okay, all right, let's pray.